no parking problems, um, it's fun, good exercise. Well, I think it keeps you healthy and it gets you to work at virtually no cost. It's cheaper, it saves me ten or a week probably. I think it's more fun as well, I'd sooner, I'd sooner have a bit of uh, workout in the morning and I'd get to work a lot more relaxed. It's healthy, uh, you see a lot more you know, when you're on a cycle been in a car. I have got a driving license, but I've always cycled, and I think I probably always will, because it's just the most efficient way to get around London. Every day, a quarter of a million Londoners use their bikes to get around, but often they face unpleasant and dangerous conditions. With the plans the Greater London Council has to help them, all that could be changed. In the 60s, cycle use declined as more and more people took to motor transport. Planners assumed that everyone's ambition was to own a car and began to predict the extinction of the urban cyclist. But in 1974, the pendulum began to swing the other way. Increased motoring costs, heavy traffic congestion and a neglected public transport system led to the emergence of a new generation of urban cyclists. Between 1972 and 1982, the number of cyclists entering central London increased by over 300%, and cyclists now make almost 5% of all journeys to work by road. This boom in cycling took London's planners by surprise. They had been designing a city for the motor car. Communities had been divided and whole areas destroyed to allow easier access to London's centre for the motorist. While pedestrians were funneled underground, cyclists were ignored altogether and often forced to compete with fast-moving streams of traffic. cyclists began to question why this should be and argue for fairer treatment on the roads. In 1981 the lobbying paid off. A new GLC administration was elected on a programme of reforming the whole of London's transport. Bus and tube fares were reduced, services improved and a long look taken at the way our road space was divided. The GLC's plans for cyclists proved to be more than just election promises. Firstly, they allocated a generous budget to pay for the cycle facilities. Councillor Paul Moore, Vice Chair of Transport at the GLC, was put in charge of implementing the cycle policies. In terms of spending on cycle facilities in London, really the GLC since 1981 has been unique compared with its predecessors. We put aside £2 million a year, that's 1% of the total GLC transport capital budget, specifically to spend on cycle facilities as well as, of course, putting aside skilled, specialised staff and their own time to talk to cycling organisations to get the plans right. The funding not only pays for schemes designed by the GLC, but also provides 100% funding for those designed by local boroughs. Although £2 million a year may seem a lot to spend on cyclists, to put it in some perspective, a mile of urban motorway like this costs at least £40 million. Secondly, a separate unit of planners and engineers was set up. Brian Lias, head of the cycling project team, describes the range of its work. Well, the main thing we're concerned with doing, of course, is implementing cycle routes to help cyclists uh, find their way around London. Um, but we're also involved in uh, monitoring what the GLC is doing in terms of um, road improvement schemes and what the borough councils are doing in traffic management. After all, there's not a great deal of point in one uh, group of people working to counteract the effects of 20 years of neglect of the interests of cyclists if other groups are busily implementing the same old mistakes in new schemes. We have a team that's large enough to cover all the skills that are needed to implement cycle routes in an urban area. We have people with wide experience in traffic engineering, in road safety, traffic and planning law, so that whatever sort of problem we come up against, there's usually someone in the team who's come up against that difficulty before and can suggest an answer. 
Our main priority is going to be to continue the routes uh, that we're already planning to link up existing ones to create a comprehensive network for London as a whole. And I think that the schemes that we'll work on in the future are likely to be more ambitious than the ones that have gone before, as we learned from our earlier work and things that have been done elsewhere in the country. Thirdly, they set up the Cycle Coordination Group, a joint committee of users and professionals where schemes are discussed at all stages of preparation. Don Matthew represents Friends of the Earth on it. First of all, they have gone out and consulted London cyclists what they actually want, whereas certainly in the past, both in London and elsewhere, a lot of authorities thought they knew best. Uh, the facilities are often planned by engineers who haven't been on a bicycle for 30 years. And certainly one of the uh, impressive features of cycle planning in London now has been the widespread consultation with uh, the various cycle groups uh, in the capital. But what in concrete terms has the GLC been able to achieve? The simplest way that cyclists have been helped has been by allowing them joint use of bus lanes. Since 1981, the network of bus lanes has been greatly extended. There are now over 200. These help protect cyclists from heavy traffic on some of the busiest roads. Or here on this Contraflow bus lane at New Oxford Street, avoid a long and busy one-way system. In creating a network of cycle routes, traffic control measures have often been taken advantage of. Cycles can be exempted from banned turns, or in complete road closures, cycle gaps can be left. These cut out motoring rat runs in residential areas and can often be made to look quite attractive. This closure separates crossroads and has removed two rat runs, yet maintained full access to the roads for cyclists. One-way streets also offer opportunities to extend the network. This is a conventional one-way street. Motorists and cyclists can travel in one direction only. It can be easily transformed into a contraflow cycle lane like this. Motorists can still only travel in one direction, but cyclists can now do so in both with the help of their own lane. Here, at Crisp Road in Hammersmith, one such contraflow lane offers a safe bypass to the Fulham Palace Road. And here, at Addison Gardens, a contraflow lane on a railway bridge forms part of a bypass to the notorious Shepherd's Bush roundabout. An increasingly popular version of this is the single point closure. The road has been plugged at one end. Motorists cannot enter this short section, but cyclists can through a small gap. But the rest of the road is two-way for all traffic. This has proved popular as it allows better access for all traffic to local homes and premises. Using devices like these and clear signposting, backstreet cycle routes such as here at the Elephant and Castle can be created in most areas of London with no significant increase in travelling distance to the cyclists. Indeed, often the routes prove shorter. When such routes cross main roads, the GLC is keen to provide special crossings. The cyclists trigger a magnetic loop in the tarmac, which changes the light stopping the traffic and allowing the cyclists to cross safely. It works in much the same way as the pedestrian push-button box at the parallel pedestrian crossing. This is a more complicated version at Bridge Avenue under the Hammersmith flyover. Crossings under the elevated section take cyclists safely over two busy main roads, linking residential and shopping areas and avoiding a large gyratory system. The cyclist on the left approaches the first road. The lights are triggered, either by the cyclist or the pedestrians on the parallel crossing, and the traffic halts allowing the cyclists and pedestrians to cross onto the centre island. The same system operates over the second road. Cyclists cannot always avoid main roads. Here on Waterloo Bridge, over 500 an hour cross during the rush hour. The first problem was how to help cyclists on the busy southern roundabout to get onto the bridge. They were often cut up by motorists turning left to cross them.
This concrete island with a cycle lane on its inside protects them and leads them onto the bridge. On the bridge itself, with flow lanes have been marked and despite being only painted lines, remind motorists very effectively that cyclists need room. Cyclists can move out of the lanes if necessary, but motorists are forbidden to enter. These lanes have been achieved while retaining the existing two traffic lanes and maintaining road capacity. There are lanes on the southbound carriageway too, but also a slip road that leads via a contraflow lane down to the river, avoiding a dangerous circuit of the roundabout. On the north side of the bridge, a slip road between the left and right turning lanes of traffic helps cyclists position themselves for turning off the bridge. This has proved popular, though not only with cyclists. The major feature of the north side is a special crossing from Wellington Place onto the bridge. Cyclists enter their own side road. From there, they are given a special signal, which allows them to cross during the pedestrian phase towards the bridge, where after a short wait for the pedestrians to clear, they can get onto the bridge. Before this scheme, cyclists were obliged to make a long journey, weaving between four lanes of traffic around the Aldwych. Now the journey is short and safe. Using a combination of these facilities, complete routes can be created. This is the Somerstown route that links Camden with Bloomsbury. It consists of two special main road crossings and this completely segregated cycleway. The second crossing takes cyclists safely across the busy Euston Road. Cyclists wait for their own signal and then proceed through the junction with the option of continuing the route down a contraflow lane. You can see here how the slip lane on the route positions the cyclists opposite the gap that has been made in the central reservation. The contraflow lane leads on to Bloomsbury. One of the designers of the route is Camden Council engineer John Nicholson. He values the cooperation he has received from the GRC. The particular advantage of working with the cycle project team is that they have skills, experience from around London, from elsewhere, that we can use, um, particularly in a field where perhaps the, you know, the, the documentation isn't yet particularly up to date. It's important to have a central organisation that you can go to, like the cycle project team, to be able, for them to be able to coordinate the, the activities at the GLC and to help you in contacting organisations outside as well. Routes like the Somerstown are appearing in boroughs all over London. One of the longest starts at Paddington Station. Hello, I'm Dick Jones from the GLC Cycling Project team. I'm here at Paddington Station, which is at the start of the Ambassador route, which is one of the first cycle routes which we designed and built in London. It shows a lot of the features that we've since incorporated into other schemes and a lot of the features that we've already seen in this film so far. So I'm now riding down through Hyde Park to Chelsea Bridge. Most of the route involves the use of relatively little traffic side roads with direction signs to guide cyclists along them. In some places, such as here in Norfolk Square, a road is closed to motor vehicles but remains open for cyclists. The oblong blue and white sign indicates that the route is one recommended for pedal cycles but is not exclusively for their use. Further along the route, here at Titchbourne Row, there's another road closure with exemption for cyclists. 
The closure had already been made before the cycle route in order to improve the environment and the safety for residents. So on southwards to Albion Gate, which is the first major feature of the route. All traffic heading south has to turn left into the Bayswater Road, except for cycles who can go straight on in parallel with pedestrians crossing at the same time and then into Hyde Park. From Albion Gate, the route proceeds to this shared cycling pedestrian path along Broadwalk. It's wide enough for both cyclists and people on foot, and there have been no recorded accidents between them in the last five years. Similarly successful schemes can be introduced throughout London on much narrower paths, as long as they are well chosen and properly marked out. And so on to Albert Gate, which was the first signal crossing for cyclists in London. There are two sets of traffic lights. The first is across the South Carriage Drive, and the other in parallel with a pedestrian crossing across Knightsbridge. The southbound route uses this segregated lane past Albert Gate itself, and then a short contraflow lane in William Street, before going on to a signposted route along mostly residential roads in Belgravia. Here we see the route being used in the northbound direction as well. It's a very attractive route through Belgravia, but it could be made even better by further traffic management, such as the road closures we saw earlier on. It's clearly a useful through route, as we can see from the numbers of taxis. Here at this junction with Pimlico Road, it was felt the traffic lights weren't needed and instead a wide central refuge has been provided. Cyclists can then go through and turn right at the signals. In the reverse direction, cyclists move into a central lane, then use the central refuge in Pimlico Road before continuing along a short section of Contraflow cycle lane. Now crossing Chelsea Bridge, having cycled down the length of the Ambassador route. We've got plans though to extend it eastwards into Mayfair and southwards in this direction down as far as Clapham. The GLC has ambitious plans for all London cyclists, from providing secure and convenient parking, through simple gaps in islands, to tackling some of London's worst danger spots, like here at Shepherd's Bush. The cycling project team, in consultation with the local borough, are creating a network of cycle routes to help cyclists through the junction. But how do London cyclists regard the GLC's efforts? 
Simon Watkins of the Cyclist Touring Club. Much of their work uh, we looked at as an example to show to other authorities. Um, in particular, not just the sorts of facilities you see here behind you, but the sort of way they go about considering cyclists in major road schemes of their own, um, in traffic management schemes and that sort of thing. We regard that, I think, as some of the most important work that the GLC does. I think they're marvellous. I know I've been cycling for a long time. Sally Burke has been arguing for cycle facilities for five years with the Islington Group of the London Cycling Campaign. They're the only authority that I can ever see has done anything for cyclists. And the hard work that you do through the boroughs, it couldn't be done without the GLC and the overall sort of planning, because you're not going to just cycle in one borough, you're going to cycle all over London. The future of cycle planning in London hinges on the future of the GLC. The GLC continues. If our plans continue, we won't be just uh, advising cyclists to wear bright clothing at night. We'll be acting to deal with safety problems on the roads and provide safe, a safe network of 1,000 miles of cycle route right the way across London. These kids on their BMXs may enjoy their stunts and safety on this special track, but how safe will they be on our open roads? If we're to create another generation of cyclists, we must plan London for them now.